This podcast is brought to you with the kind support of Plutus Capital, a female-run investment management firm based in Evanston, Illinois, which works with clients in a wide variety of mandates such as custom diversity solutions, manager due diligence, diversified hedge fund to fund allocations, and advisory services. Our next guest is one of the first people I got to know in the long short manager selection space. Let's hear how her beliefs have evolved in equity manager selection and how she is now incorporating that knowledge into her role at a large U.S. university endowment. I think certain areas such as the China onshore markets are just, you know, ideally set up for active stock selection. You have a very large retail base, you have a fast growing economy and you've got liquidity, which you don't often have in setups like that. I'm joined today by Margot O'Brien, who is Investment Director at the University of California Investment Office, based in Oakland, California. She previously spent over 14 years in the fund of hedge fund area, where she specialized in equity long short and other equity hedge funds. Prior to that, she was an investment consultant. Welcome, Margot. Thank you for joining me today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Let's start maybe by talking a little bit about your current role and what your main focus is there at the University of California. Yes, sure. So as you mentioned, I'm a director on the public equities team at uh, the University of California. We are part of the Office of the President, which is sort of the central administrative organization for the whole UC system, you know, which is 10 campuses, five hospital groups, three national laboratories. So, you know, a a very large system. And our office draws capital from the uh, UC retirement plan which is a defined benefit pension fund. We have an endowment, which is a fund made available to the campuses whereby they can outsource the management of their campus or foundation assets to our office. And there's also a DC pension and sort of various short-term liquidity pools available. So the team that I'm on, we manage the active equity allocation, uh, which is all outsourced to external managers. And it's sort of a mixture of long only and longer biased hedge funds in the public equity portfolio. And what is the total size of, uh, how do you think, about the endowment portfolio or the aggregate portfolios that your office would be responsible for? Yeah, so it's fairly sizable. Of all of the pools of capital is just north of $160 billion in assets um, at the moment. That has grown significantly just in the two or three years that I've been there, just mostly due to investment performance, which has been quite strong. So the majority of that would be the retirement plan. The endowment itself is in that high teens billions. And can you maybe then, going back to your background, where did you grow up and how did you come to enter the world of investment? Yeah, sure. So I guess I have a fairly unusual background. I grew up in South Africa, in Johannesburg. I went to university in Cape Town uh, with the intention of becoming a lawyer, actually, uh, like yourself. But I had to do a business undergrad degree. And that's when I sort of first, I guess, came across investing in in a serious way. I had a lecturer who had worked at a European hedge fund. And, you know, I think just hearing him discuss how sort of various trends around the world could be expressed in investments was just really fascinating for me. I think I'd always been very curious about the world. I'd had a few trips abroad, but, you know, generally South Africa is an incredible place, but it did feel quite far from the rest of the world when I was growing up. So this just seemed like a perfect way to sort of express that passion of curiosity for the rest of the world. Um, so, so I switched a few courses and ended up doing a more finance related, my degree became more finance related. And then once I graduated, I became an investment consultant initially at Alexander Forbes in South Africa. And then I moved to London in the early 2000s and had a similar role at what was then Mellon Bank. But I think, you know, I felt, I think like many people, consulting can be a bit of a challenging role. And I don't think it sort of sparked that passion that I had sort of found in university And so I ended up joining a fund of hedge fund firm, FRM, in 2004, and I ended up spending the next 14 years there, principally focused on equity hedge funds, starting off in London, moving to their Hong Kong office in 2008, a great timing (laughs) to look at Asian hedge funds. I then moved back to London in 2009 uh, to focus on Europe. And then in 2013, sort of about a year after we'd been acquired by Man Group, I moved to the New York office. So, yeah, I think, I guess that's a, a quick summary of my background. I, my family and I moved to California in 2018. And so I've been working at UC ever since. So, yeah, it's been quite an, an adventure. <laughs> it's interesting something you said about some of the challenges of being an investment consultant, and then you moved to the an asset manager at role. Was it the lack of trigger pulling or and maybe the focus on just remaining in the advisory function that you found challenging in investment consulting? Yes, I think so. I think, you know, at the time I explained it as kind of just the distance from the investment decision was quite large. 
you know, I mean, clearly at a fund of funds, you're still not the one making the primary investment decisions, but it felt a lot closer to what was happening, you know, to the markets. And, and I really sort of enjoyed that part of it. I think, you know, I think assessing managers is a very specific skill set versus assessing a stock, clearly. And I think that there's parts of my skill set that are well suited to it. So it seemed like a good mix to sort of almost go from, a, not from a consultant to a stock picker, but something sort of halfway in the fund of funds or allocator type world. And I know you spent a lot of your career analyzing equity managers and equity long short managers. What would you say are your investment beliefs, whether in, in that domain or, or, or more generally, and how have they evolved over time? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, I'd say constantly evolving. <laughs> I think someone once described sort of allocating to me as this sort of very fascinating game in that, you know, depending on your mandate and your the kind of parameters around the capital that you're managing, the things that you look for in managers will definitely vary. So, you know, I think, for example, when I was more in the hedge fund space, things like I was very focused on portfolio management, almost at the expense of stock selection. You know, stock selection is clearly incredibly important, but I think especially in the equity space, you can get overly focused on it. And I think, you know, portfolio management has just as large an impact on returns, if not more so than the stock selection side of things. So I really used to dig into that a lot more. And I found it incredibly helpful in terms of giving me a sense of the manager's approach to investing. You know, if I asked someone why they chose a particular level of gross exposure. And the answer was, I've always managed it there. You know, that tells me that this is someone who has maybe not thought that deeply enough about, about how they're sizing their portfolio and how they're running it, you know, as an example. But then, you know, I think since moving to UC, where we definitely have a longer bias outlook, we have a market index as a benchmark. I think we've definitely switched more to the stock selection side of things again. I think here we can take on a lot more risk, a lot more concentration. And therefore, the stock selection skills are, you know, in many cases, a lot more important than the portfolio management. So it does really evolve with time, as you mentioned. And I'm sure it will continue to as, you know, markets change and evolve as well. It's interesting you make the point about moving to a more of a long oriented approach. Do you think that have you lost any confidence maybe in the in the raison d'etre of, say, of some long short hedge funds? Do you think that they've had their heyday? Do you think they'll continue to play such a large role? Yeah, it's a great question because I think it's something that I've really sort of had to come to terms with since moving at UC. I think when I initially joined and started to meet with some of the long only managers, it did seem almost overly simplistic to me. You know, having come from the hedge fund space, which was incredibly analytical and technical in many instances. And I, you know, I was a bit unsure whether this was maybe the correct thing to have done. But then, of course, they make so much money, <laughs> you know, so I'm like, well, clearly I've got to kind of evolve my thinking on this. And I think the interesting thing with being longer bias or long only is that there isn't an expectation that you're not going to lose money when the market goes down. You know, the risk factor of the equity beta is known to everyone. So it isn't necessarily a surprise when the portfolio falls, when the markets fall. And in actual fact, if you have longer duration capital, it's a great opportunity. You know, whereas I think in long short land, there's still this kind of mythology about how the short books should prevent you fully participating in the downside or even make money on the downside. And I think, you know, I think that always tends to end up being disappointing. You know, it's always for different reasons as well. And so I think investors just end up getting disappointed. And then even in strong years for these strategies, they don't tend to keep up with the market that well. And if I can buy a passive index, you know, for minimal fees, I think it does start to, you know, really question what the role of these strategies are. So I haven't completely lost faith in hedge funds. You know, I think what we found is when we are looking at strategies in particular markets or regions, the hedge funds generally have very impressive stock selection processes. They have very deep understanding of names and you tend to have more unique perspectives than I think a lot of the long only. So I think sometimes it might just be some redesigning of the mandate that needs to happen. You know, so we've gone in and sort of made a longer bias or concentrated best idea type portfolios with hedge funds. And those have been, you know, particularly successful. So I think there is incredible skill in the hedge fund space. I just think maybe in the equity side, it needs to be repackaged when looking at larger allocators that do have a market index to beat. 
It's a very interesting insight. And you mentioned also focusing a lot more on the stock pickers now. Are there any areas where you think that, say, that stock pickers are still continuing to really outperform? I suppose we're coming at a backdrop of a, you know, a movement towards passive, maybe kind of a persistent underperformance of active managers on average. Do you see that maybe in pockets such as either by region or by market cap, that there is a better alpha, I suppose, available to stock pickers? Yeah, certainly. And I think a lot of the philosophy at UC is centered on that is, you know, looking at markets where there are inefficiencies that stock selectors have a better chance of beating the market. So, you know, I think certain areas such as the China onshore markets are just, you know, ideally set up for active stock selection. You have a very large retail base, you have a fast growing economy, and you've got liquidity, which you don't often have in setups like that. I think particular sectors as well, where you might need sort of a specialized skill set, such as healthcare, that can be particularly interesting depending on the individual managers. But, you know, I think in general there, you know, there are these pockets and it's just sort of, it's kind of up to us whether we express that through an active manager, if we can find someone good enough to be consistently beat the market or if we can express that through a passive index. So, I don't think we necessarily see it as active versus passive. I think it's more how can we add the most value here while controlling for our fees. Having said that, you know, I think the last year or so coming through the pandemic, you know, you've really seen, I think, a resurgence of active management. I think a number of people were able to take advantage of the volatility in markets uh, in March and April and really, you know, upgrade their portfolios. And that was exactly the right thing to do. So I, th- I think it's been quite fascinating to sort of see that narrative of, you know, passive threatening actives sort of take a little bit of a pause, despite the fact that markets have been so strong over the last year or so. That's an interesting point. I think it's a narrative that will probably follow us our entire careers. And we'll still be discussing this in 20 years time. So just stepping back, we've talked a lot about the, the equity portfolio, stepping back a bit to the overall endowment investor perspective. What's at the forefront of your mind now in your role in a university endowment? That's a great question, you know, and I think certainly this is my view, not UC's, but I think that there's a lot of sort of questioning over the sort of traditional Yale endowment model of having a a largest allocation to privates. It's been a very successful space. There's a lot of capital chasing quite few opportunities. So valuations are very high. And so, you know, the, I think the solution has been to grow it slower, but then what do you do with the rest of that portfolio? You know, I think that's been something that a lot of people have had to grapple with. You know, equities have performed very well, so that seems to have been the correct answer. But would you add additional allocation right now at the levels we're at? It's not clear. So, yeah, I'd say in the sort of immediate term, that's what people are looking at. Longer term, I think things like relations with China are in the front of people's minds. As I mentioned earlier, that's been a, a market that a lot of endowments are interested in. You know, are there any threats to our ability to be able to invest in that or some regulatory issues that may occur in China? So, yeah, there's, you know, there's many issues, but that's what I would be thinking about at the moment. And what is it that you like about the world of investing? You know, I think, as I mentioned earlier, I I feel like I've always been sort of very curious and interested in the world at large and understanding, you know, what's driving trends. And I think, in investments, you, you really get to have a deep dive on a lot of those trends that are, are kind of driving society. And, you know, through sort of conferences or managers, you really get to hear from incredible experts. And, you know, that just, I think, hearing their views on these, these areas that they're very focused on, it can be very inspirational. And what's great is that these trends are constantly changing. So, you know, it's not like you sort of get stuck looking at one type of issue all the time. It, you know, it, it really varies. I, I seem to remember at the start of my career, having to know a lot about kind of Norwegian oil services, you know, and now sort of having to learn a lot more about, you know, green technology. It's sort of really, you know, kind of come full circle. And I, and I think that's just always been really fantastic. I think just the people in general that you meet, you know, I think on the allocator side, there tends to be a fairly eclectic group of backgrounds. And so I've just, you know, I think I've met and made a fantastic number of friends and my network is very interesting to me. So yeah, I think I, I think we have fantastic jobs. Uh, I think it's one that I still really enjoy after all these years. <laughs> and we've been in the industry broadly similar amounts of time. Uh, have mm-hmm. you seen many changes in terms of the complexion of the industry and its diversity uh, over the course of time? And how do you give it a score now? Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's certainly better, you know, I'd say since we joined. Having said that, you know, I feel like when I entered the industry, 
my sort of gender and the diversity of the industry just wasn't really something I was too aware of. You know, I certainly was aware that there weren't many women, but, you know, I didn't necessarily see it as a barrier or something that needed to be treated differently, you know, which I guess maybe is my background. I think I probably have my parents to thank for that. I don't think, you know, my gender's ever been something that's sort of shaped what or how I think about career opportunities. But I think definitely as I've sort of grown up in the industry and started to just become a little bit more aware of the kind of lopsidedness of things, it has become something that I've become more focused on. And in terms of your question on where I would score it, I think it's it's interesting because we have a lot more data to be able to use now to score the industry. You know, in terms of the, tr- the increased transparency requirements that are in some countries, you know, such as the UK, a number of organizations, including UC, we, you know, we poll our managers on the diversity. And, and I think you can see there's still a lot of work to be done. You know, even where there are the splits between male and female are close, I think if you dig into it, you look at... Oftentimes it's limited to more junior or mid-level positions or in specific functional areas. And so, you know, I, I think the, the glass ceiling, has, you know, has certainly been shattered by a number of kind of pioneering women. There's still something there. There's still some kind of, I don't know, jelly ceiling. <laughs> you know, you can break through it, but it's still certainly harder than if nothing was there. So, no, it's absolutely, I completely see that. And I think for me, part of the disappointing aspect is that the pipeline doesn't look better. It's better mm-hmm. than it used to be, but it should be a lot better, I think, at this stage. And I think that some of that is just not seeing enough role models and maybe the industry not doing a good enough job of advertising itself. It has a wide range of roles available. That's a really good point. And, you know, I think that may be a, an issue for finance in general. You know, I think as a young person today, if you have to look at the industries that you want to go into, you know, I think being based in the Bay Area, it's just really stark, the difference in like work flexibility, benefits, you know, HR policies that are employed by tech companies versus finance companies. And, you know, so I think certainly generally attracting young people is something that finance probably needs to get better at. But I think specifically for women, you know, I mean, I think we've all said this, you know, you can't be what you can't see. And I think there are more women that are coming into more visible you know, positions such as yourself. So I think like the organizations that, you know, girls who invest that, all that type of thing, I I think are doing incredible work. But I think the thing that really kind of gives me some hope in this area is kind of this sort of popularization of the academic research that shows that, you know, diverse teams perform better than non-diverse teams. You know, money talks. And I think that's particularly true in finance. And if we can show that, you know, diverse managers are going to add more value to our portfolios, then that needs to be something that our managers pay serious attention to. You know, UC has definitely been on the front foot about this issue. We have proactively had discussions with a number of our managers on their issues just to sort of really bring home to them the fact that this is something that we take seriously. And, you know, given the research, it's something that they should take seriously too. And I think it can be a really big opportunity. It, you know, it doesn't need to be a a contentious issue. You know, this is not some people losing out for jobs so that other people can get it. You know, if your performance is better, your business can grow and you can just hire more people in general. So I think it could be seen as a real kind of opportunity for our industry to grow in general and then hopefully bring in more diverse people. I think the other interesting point on this is you mentioned the pipeline. You know, I think a lot of it is sort of shifting people's view on how you hire people. You know, I think often, I'm sure you've seen this when you speak to managers, it's there's been an emphasis on hiring people, you know, or hiring people with one degree of separation or, you know, going through very traditional kind of recruiter routes. And, you know, that's now been shown through these studies that if you have people with similar backgrounds, you're going to think relatively similarly. And so you will have similar blind spots. So it's in your interest to try and go outside of your network to hire people that you don't know, maybe hire from schools that you don't normally consider. Looking at different organizations potentially for recruiting can be helpful. And so, you know, I think just A, broadening that funnel to get people into organizations and shifting the areas where you put that funnel can actually make a big difference currently, you know, without having to wait for a 
who knows how many years before that younger pipeline starts to fill up properly again. That's such an interesting discussion. I think the more I've spoken to people about it and even thought about it myself, I think values are what's are really important. The alignment of values along mm-hmm. with cognitive diversity. So if you can combine those two, I think you, you will have a winning team. But there's clearly a lot more work to be done in the area, but at least the process has started. So just moving back a little bit to your personal story, You've worked in the hedge fund industry, which I'm sure is, I know, is filled with egos and some mercurial characters. Have there been any <laughs> challenges or, or maybe mistakes or anything that you've made in some of your, your selections or just assessment of character? Anything that you've learned lessons from? Oh, yes. Yes. I mean, many, many mistakes. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, many setbacks and challenges, I think. Yeah, it would be disingenuous to say not. You know, I, I think the lessons I've learned from the mistakes have been that you know, you shouldn't actually take them too seriously. Like everyone does make mistakes. You know, you've learned a lesson from them. It's just to sort of get back up and keep moving forward. You know, I think certainly like the number of technical sort of investment level lessons I've learned has sort of accumulated over the years. And I think been helpful. I think having been through a few market cycles now, I think I've become a lot more sensitive to when people are feeling kind of overly bullish or bearish and maybe sort of acting as a counterbalancing viewpoint. I think has often been helpful. And yeah, you know, I think the important thing is, you know, people talk a lot about resilience and I I think I always used to think that resilience was, you know, just being able to cope with change easily. The truth is, I, I don't think that is what it is. I think change is difficult for everybody, even if the end product ends up being something good. And so it's just about, you know, getting up every day and keep going. You know, I think that's uh, that's been key in my career is just, you know, not to give up and just every day is a new day and you can, you know, make things better. So yeah, maybe a bit more philosophical than you were looking for, but <laughs> that, that, that's, <laughs> wonderful. that's what I've been taught by the, uh, by the mistakes. <laughs> and looking at any key people in your life that had an impression on you or, or shaped the course of your career, is there anyone that you can mention there? Sure. Yeah. You know, I think I've been lucky to work with a lot of, you know, incredibly smart people that have helped me in different ways. So I certainly wouldn't be able to mention all of them, but you know, the people that come to mind, my first boss at FRM, Mike Burton, you know, he's just a, a very gracious individual. And I think he was, you know, incredibly important in kind of forming the kind of, I guess, career citizen that I am in the world. And he's always been incredibly supportive, which has been helpful. I think my prior CIO at Man FRM, Keith Hayden, is just someone who I think of is incredibly smart and insightful. And I think some of the kind of feedback he's given me personally has helped me a lot in my personal development. And, and just, I think some of the kind of investment principles that I kind of think about, a lot of them have come from him, which has been really helpful. But you know, now I'm in my new journey as well. I think the CIO and COO at UC are really sort of showing me a different way of investing in terms of, you know, investing for a public institution and for stakeholders that are, you know, many hundreds of years away potentially. And that's, it's been a very interesting journey. So, yeah, I think those were kind of key in terms of shaping my career. But I think, as I mentioned earlier, I, the people you meet in this in- industry are very inspirational. You know, I think hearing about people, the way they deal with setbacks is very helpful. I think how they deal with, you know, personal situations, becoming a parent, say, and and how they've been able to balance that has been incredibly interesting. So, yeah, I think it's a real mosaic of people that I've met through the years that has enabled me to keep, to get to where I am. It's funny because there is a drama component to markets that I think probably enhances the the drama that's in everybody's life. So those of us Mm -hmm. who operate in in markets not only have to contend with our own personal ups and downs, but also the market ups and downs and the industry fortune ups and downs. So I think that probably does intensify some of the experience. Just again, um, (laughs) in terms of some of the people and maybe any words of wisdom that they've shared with you or any creed or motto that you live by. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, like I mentioned, I think when people sort of give you feedback, I think that's been incredibly helpful. But I think the thing that I kind of immediately go to when you said that was advice given to me, you know, by sort of a colleague in the industry, you know, not necessarily someone I work with. And I guess just talking about, you know, being maybe intimidated to speak up in meetings or, or anything like that. And, you know, I think all of us hopefully at some point have felt a little bit like that. And I I think that the thing she said to me was that she was far more senior. She said she'd been interviewed on the BBC once and she was terrified of doing it. And someone had said to her, you know, instead of encouraging her to kind of believe her in herself and say there's value in what you have to say, blah, blah. They said to her, you know, stop being so arrogant. 
you know, do you really think people are listening that closely to what you have to say? And I think, you know, this, that to me was just advice that really stuck, you know, it kind of really depressurized situations for me. And I think, you know, instead of it's sort of me sort of striving to sort of show and believe how valuable my opinion was, it kind of shifted the emphasis to, you know, this is not just a big deal, just, you know, say what you need to say and then, and then kind of see what happened. And I think that really kind of, that just really helped me get more comfortable with, you know, vocalizing my opinion to the point that, you know, nowadays I don't, I don't even think about it, but I, I think that was really key in my career because I think I see a lot of people who, who struggle with that. And I definitely, you know, pass that advice on. And I think in terms of a particular creed or motto, you know, I, I don't have a particular saying, I think, you know, I try to be pleasant. I try to give people the benefit of the doubt, you know, and, and kind of recognize that I don't always have the right or best answers in every situation. So to just kind of have humility, I think I'm not trying to sort of, you know, underplay how I view myself or be naive or anything like that. But I think one of the things I've learned from, you know, living and working in so many different markets is that there's just so much complexity and nuance in people and cultures and investment trends and companies that you really need to, I think, approach every kind of meeting and kind of a learning and listening mindset and, you know, not sort of be in there to try to prove how much you need, you know, or outsmart someone. You know, I think it's, yeah, you know, it's really important to just to be there to listen and to to find out the information that you need to find. So anyway, that's what I aspire to. And then someday. Um, and that is a <laughs> Your senior colleague, I think, <laughs> your senior colleague has given us a very realistic, I think, and you know, refreshing <laughs> approach to what is often a, a source of, uh, of much anxiety. So thank you for sharing that. And my last question is around any advice you might have for your younger self. Anything you know now that you wish you had known maybe in a, down there in Cape Town about to graduate? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say just stop worrying. You know, it's all going to work out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, enjoy the experience. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> well, that's a wonderfully positive note to end on. And Margot, it's really been such a pleasure. I've always seen you as setting the standard when it comes to long, short manager selection. I think you're one of the first and are still one of the best. So um, it's been such a pleasure to to share ideas here and also to for you to share how your ideas have evolved over time. So I really appreciate you sharing your insights with us. Not at all. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm Ethan Devitt. Thank you for listening to the 50 Faces podcast. If you liked what you heard and would like to tune in to hear more inspiring investors and their personal journeys, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice and all views are personal and should not be attributed to the organizations and affiliations of the host or any guest. <laughs>